Coming up, land back in Louisiana. Artists gather in Rapid City, South Dakota, and the singing psychologist. Plus, a look at the Alaska Federation of Natives meeting. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Amirawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. We start our newscast in California, where a tribal nation is suing the federal government for allegedly violating its tribal sovereignty. Earlier this week, the Hoopa Valley tribe renewed a lawsuit it filed against the Trump administration in 2020. The lawsuit alleges that the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation failed to collect over $340 million from California farms that rely on federally supplied water. The area under dispute is the Trinity River. The tribal nation says that the body of water is used for food and cultural purposes and has been decimated after the federal government diverted water for decades. By federal law, contractors who use that water are required to pay money for their use that goes towards projects like habitat restoration. Michael Orcutt is the Hoopa Fisheries Director. He said that because the government declared, quote, mission accomplished on the project, that meant the agency could stop the payments owed, which in turn devastated his tribe. Hoopa Valley says it ultimately chose to renew its lawsuit after a lack of action from the Biden administration. State-recognized tribes in Alabama and North Carolina are continuing to work towards becoming federally recognized. Groups in both states are hoping that two outgoing U.S. senators can help them achieve what has just been out of arm's reach. Potential victories in Congress could mean millions of dollars in federal funding. Retiring Senator Richard Shelby is handling a bill for the MOA Band of Choctaw Indians in Alabama. And North Carolina Senator Richard Burr is sponsoring similar legislation for the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. Former MOA chief Freeman Weaver says the funding for federal program is what's at stake for his nation. And what it does is get, let the federal government recognize our sovereignty and we have the ability then to do more things without having state interference or local county interference or even municipalities wanting to encroach on our lands. In 1997, a Bureau of Indian Affairs investigation found that MOA descendancy stories could not be substantiated by the federal agency. Now to Kansas, where a ground search of a former boarding school has been delayed. Last year, the Kansas Historical Society announced it would partner with the state's geological survey and the University of Kansas to conduct a ground-penetrating radar survey at the Shawnee Indian Mission. However, last week, officials said the project was on hold indefinitely. That's because the chief of the Shawnee tribe, Ben Barnes, said the tribe was not consulted about the proposal. City Commissioner Nathan Noglemere said in August, the Kansas Historical Society met with Barnes and offered him the opportunity of consultation. Then on Monday, Barnes said he was given a short paper saying the organization had already begun the process of inspection, which led Barnes to say that that's not consultation. The area was formerly known as the Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School. It was founded by a Methodist minister and had nearly 200 students a year who ranged in age from 5 to 23. 
Well, a popular search engine redesigned their logo in honor of Native American Heritage Month. On November 1st, Google's logo was redesigned by Spirit Lake Dakota, Mohegan, and Muskogee artist Marle Marlena Miles to depict a game of stickball. According to Miles, the stickball has the the cultural significance of being a healing sport for tribal communities. The G of the logo is illustrated as an elder smudging, and the O displays a medicine wheel. Miles hopes her doodle will represent Native people living in a healthy and modern way. More on Native American Heritage Month as Molly of Denali is kicking off its third season with new episodes. This fan favorite series follows the adventures of 10-year-old Molly Mabray, who is a curious and resourceful Alaska Native girl. The award-winning series features outdoor adventures and the celebration of Alaska Native communities. The show will kick off its third season with three episodes in honor of Native American Heritage Month. They will premiere on PBS Kids starting on November 7th and ending on November 9th. The series is also rolling out 20 brand new shorts on November 7th as well. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. The Tunica Biloxi Tribe of Louisiana is celebrating a land back victory. For years, tribal leaders tried to get ownership of the Marksville Historic State Park, a place that is home to burial sites. Marshall Perit, the chairman of the Tunica Biloxi Tribe of Louisiana, describes the land. It consists of 42 acres. It's part of our ancestral homelands. Uh, we were great stewards. Our ancestors were stewards over the land, and we are delighted and overjoyed that Tunica Biloxi once again is the rightful owner of these uh, burial grounds, uh, our sacred grounds, because it means so much to us. Chairman Perit describes the process of the land return. Well, the journey actually started in the early 80s once we was uh, federal recognized by the late chairman, O.J. Barber Sr., approaching then-Governor uh, Dave Treen about transferring the property. And um, that process has been undergone through every one of his administration. Then it was picked up by Chairman uh, Joy Paul Barber. And finally, uh, during this administration, we regain ownership of the property. And we are grateful um, to the city of Marksville, the state of Louisiana, but most importantly to the mayor, Lamo John Lamont, and the council members for utilizing all three components of vision, uh, hindsight, insight, and foresight, recognizing the value of and the cultural value of what the property meant to Tunica Biloxi Tribe of Louisiana. One of the things, they went into a budget crisis. Uh, they, didn't, they couldn't afford to the upkeep and maintenance of the property. So um, this started a conversation really heated up about two years ago and to see if we'd be willing to take it on when we was excited uh, and said, yes, this has been an ongoing battle for over uh, 40 years. We would love our ancestral property back for us to uh, create a revitalization program as well as a beautification program. And most importantly, um, to rededicate that land um, uh, and rededicate it to a way where we recognize it uh, today, significance of the place of grace, because again, so many of our ancestors, their final resting place is there and what is also there is stories that was never told, relationships that was never formed, um, opportunities that never came to realization because all of those things was taken away from our ancestors because of the battles or storms or the injustice by the system or by the um, population at that time. So, um, we just, again, overjoyed that the property is in our, um, back in our hands where we can 
take care of it and create a, a memory, um, a memorial there, as well as for the grandchildren, great-grandchildren to enjoy the property as um, our ancestors should have had the opportunity to enjoy it. The chairman says the community reaction has been positive. Well, their reaction was very positive because they've been all alone cheering on the process, saying that the land should be donated back to Tunica Valencia because this is our rightful and um, property, our ancestral lands. They understand the cultural value of it. And so uh, the significant value. So they, re they really cheered on the process and it was very encouraging throughout the process. The chairman stands in solidarity with other tribes seeking land returns. I would tell them never give up, keep on the good fight of fate and also remember why you're doing it. And it's not the only because it's a piece of property, it's because of the sacrifices that our ancestors went through. And those sacrifices cannot prepare and the sacrifices that we have today. They sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, because of the injustices that they had to go through. So continue that fight. And, um, and our hope and prayers is going to be with each and every one until um, you get your uh, ownership of your uh, of your land and uh, don't get discouraged uh, get it one acre as, at a time uh, like Tunica Biloxi did we made sure we fought the good battle of fate day after day and um, it was a very um, great experience and again we thrilled and overjoyed to have our property back. That was Tunica Biloxi Chairman Marshall Perit. When we come back, a Rapid City art space gets a funding boost. Racing Magpie was awarded $40,000 over two years from the Wagner Foundation and VIA Art Fund. Peter Strong and Mary Bordeaux talked with ICT's Shirley Snavy about the grant. Consortium of funders on the East Coast who came to get, who come together to support arts organizations around the country that are trying to push forward uh, or foster like ongoing dialogue about important um, artistic and creative endeavors and so we we were encouraged by a few other people to put our hats in the in the ring and we applied and were awarded it uh, earlier this year and it's a um, it's intended to be like general operating support as far, as far as the funds go just to support us in continuing to do what we're doing and then um, we're part of a cohort so by the end of our two-year run we're going to visit with the other organizations and become part of this um, national network of organizations trying to do this. So Mary tell us a little bit about the history of Racing Magpie. So um, we actually started out as a LLC um, and we're um, you know similar to what we do now uh, artist studios community space and a gallery um, but you know, Racing Magpie, um, actually we wanted to just be a gallery and like an office space. And then um, then we, some of our friends who are artists and work in the creative field were like, oh, we, I, I need an office space and we don't need a lot. So maybe we could go in together. Um, and then an artist was like, it would be cool if I could have a studio space. And we're like, yeah, that would be cool. And then pretty soon what was gonna be like an office and a gallery turned out to be like, 8,500 square feet of like studio space and classroom space and nonprofit office space. And it just kind of grew. And 
um, you know, as we were like seven years old um, now, and you know, in the within the first couple of years, um, really just heard from a lot of artists and community um, the needs that they had and wanted, and um, to be able to spend time together and have these flexible flexible spaces to um, do like sewing circles or um, community meetings or. Um, um, I was trying to think of the other things that classes. we've had. We've had classes and uh, workshops and things like that too. So, um, and so we've been trying to be just really responsive to what the community needs. And um, we started out in downtown Rapid City um, and then have within the past couple of years, we were able to purchase a bu building or two buildings. It was kind of a two for one. Had, if we wanted one, we had to buy the other one too. So. <laughs> We have two buildings and similar square footage now, and um, but realizing that we needed more flexible space than artist space, because um, uh, and so that's and but we have a bigger gallery now, and yeah. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, just to reframe what Mary's saying too, I think one thing we started out with, and we've been really focused on with our board and our work, is this idea of recentering the conversation about arts and culture around the artists and the community. I think like that's a big picture shift that that we it's just natural to Mary and me and to the folks who interact with us regularly. But I think it's not so common in non-native art settings and and elsewhere, even around here in in the Rapid City area or in South Dakota, you know, studio spaces and and space and programming for folks to talk to each other and listen and share ideas and be inspired. And a gallery that's for native artists um, that's not based on solely on sales, right? Mm -hmm. Like taking some of the market pressure off of artists. How can we curate exhibits where artists can really explore their creative expression and the impact that has on issues like racism in South Dakota and Rapid City? or um yeah i mean all those issues right like i think art is that place where those conversations can start among people with differing different ideas and different backgrounds and i i'd like to think that we've been doing that over the last seven years and and we keep trying to center that in the work we do in the future um how long have you been in south dakota i have been here 17 years, almost 18. I moved in 2005 to be the director at Red Cloud at the Heritage Center. I remember meeting you and uh, uh, that was interesting. You said, yeah, I think I'll stay here for a couple of years. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, I think that's everyone who moves here. Just two to three years and yeah, here I am. And, um, and it's the place and it's the artists and it's the, the family, right? Um, being married into a Lakota family and it's important to be here and build relationship and and follow through on those relationships too. So for me as a white guy uh, who grew up in Ohio and who's lived in a few different places, it it's about relationship with people and place and um, Racing Magpie, I think centers that as well in everything we do. For years, Daryl Tonema has worked with tribal communities and organizations to tackle both mental health and physical health. He has a PhD in counseling, psychology, and cultural studies. He's also an award-winning musician. Now he's blended both in a podcast series called The Singing Psychologist. Well, coming out of COVID, I've got, I had so many phone calls from tribes and school districts and communities about people having their first bout with stress or depression or anxiety um, and a significant uptick in suicidality, suicidal ideation, suicide attempt in our communities. And there were just so much work that needed to be done. Um, I thought, well, what if we could use technology to kind of get more information out? So um, we started doing the podcast called The Singing Psychologist. And uh, really the, the heart of it is to get um, information and tools to as, as many people as we can, using technology really creates economies of scale so folks, more folks have access to it. One of the episodes is called Grit. Grit, there's been a lot of research, oh, probably the past five years around the concept of grit. Um, and, and the research 
found that uh, out of all the uh, athleticism and, and, and intellectual and, and heart and things like that, the, the, the one thing that really contributed to people moving forward was grit, was that I'm going to keep trying. Um, I think that's a great message for uh, myself, uh, for my children, for our communities is there are a lot of obstacles. There are a lot of barriers. It's been hard. And particularly the last couple of years have been especially hard. And keep leaning into it as, as communities. One of, the, um, one of the, the core statements, values of, of the podcast is the concept of personal sovereignty. So sovereignty in a uh, social, cultural context is, are we in charge of our uh, language and finances and government and ceremony, things like that? That's sovereignty in, in, our, in our social perspective. But uh, personal, individual sovereignty is, can I even control my heart rate? In this moment, can I, can I control my own body so so I have a menu of, of responses instead of just a reaction? Because what stress and trauma, what their end game is, is to strip us of sovereignty. Stress and trauma's end game is to have us hiding in our houses, in our bedrooms, under the blankets, not wanting to engage in the world. And part of how we reclaim sovereignty is is opening those doors and kicking open those silos and, and re-engaging community. Um, one of the cool things that, that I like to say is that in, in the, well, I think it's cool anyway, <laughs> is that we, we suffer in silos and we, we heal, we thrive in community. And community is really the foundation of, of us as Native people. One podcast deals with historical trauma. A lot of work uh, and a lot of great work um, talks about uh, trauma as just a cognitive process. And that's where people say things like, well, why don't you just get over it? Think about something differently, which it's much more complicated than that because all the research uh, that, that leans into this talks about at, at the cellular level, how the body bears the burden. And I'm just fascinated with, with the vagus nerve and how it has changed to help us to survive. Uh, and if... If we haven't done our healing, then I'm just passing some more on to my children and their children and their children. And so one of the ways that, that I can speak to my descendants and one of the ways that my ancestors, ancestors speak to me is what healing things are we doing in our homes, in myself, in our communities, that we the vagus nerve, which kind of reads all of this body information, can start to heal, can start to thrive. So it, it does give me a, a more sense of uh, personal, and personal sovereignty. One of Dr. Tonema's goals is to strengthen community. Well, I hope we're building community. That's, that's really the foundation. It, it isn't, and honestly, my full intention is just to get information out to people. It has uh, very little to do with me. I just want to make sure that, well, this is this, and I consider um, our work to be as, um, as translators. I'll, I'll, I'll look at all this research and I'll read all these texts and I'll say, well, oh, this, we need to know this. And I'll use that as, uh, as uh, the format to get the information to the people. And, and I hope the communities, uh, we create communities of healing with each other. I, I hope that people start to recognize that we aren't crazy and we aren't, aren't wrong. We aren't ruined. We are built for survival. And sometimes that looks uncomfortable. But once we start leaning into that as groups, as, as people saying, we want something different. We want something. We want to be more empowered in our in our social groups. Then those that starts to expand, and that starts to expand, and that can be a very powerful thing. And it's 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 cool to be involved in my little way. That was singing psychologist Daryl Tonema. After three years, the largest gathering for Native people in Alaska is back. The Alaska Federation of Natives annual convention brought in thousands of delegates and participants from across the state. Leaders addressed critical issues of public policy and government for Alaska Native communities. ICT's Mackenzie Allen Charmley reports. The Alaska Federation of Natives annual convention returned in person for the first time since going virtual due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The AFN conference brought big crowds. Over 140,000 Native people were represented from all parts of the state. The convention serves as the leading forum and voice of Alaska Natives in addressing issues of public policy and government. Julie Kitka, president of AFN, kicked off the event with gratitude. 
Even political celebrities, including Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland and State Representative Mary Peltola, made an appearance where many rallied in support for Peltola in this upcoming election. Usually our best leaders are unifiers, and Alaska is full of leaders who exemplify unifying people and unity. The theme of the conference this year is celebrating our unity, and with people traveling from all over the state, that couldn't be more true. From artists and exhibits to workshops and family, the FN's gathering continues to strengthen Alaska Native communities. The most popular event was Kuyana Nights, meaning thank you in Yupik, which included traditional dancers from 14 groups throughout Alaska. Through the years, the cultural celebration has helped restore traditional dances and is now a treasured highlight of every convention. The conference ended with its staple statewide candidates forum, promoting an underlying message of the conference to get out and vote. Candidates for the U.S. Senate, U.S. House, and gubernatorial races answered questions about current issues to inform Alaskan voters. And like many successful indigenous gatherings, this one ended with smiles, laughs, and hugging ways. In Anchorage, Alaska, Mackenzie Allen Charmley for ICT News. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.